Now, it's been a few weeks since I've done one of these retro wrestling reviews, so I figured I'd better start getting back into the flow of doing them, because frankly, I enjoy going back and watching these old shows, whether they're good or bad, um, because even the bad ones can still have some redeeming qualities, or they can at least be fun to talk about, if anything else. Um, so I'll, I'll have a couple more of these up the next week or two. If you have suggestions for future ones you would like to see me do as part of this retro wrestling review series, and again, it could be old pay-per-views, it could be old Raws, Nitros, Smackdowns, it could be DVDs, it could be wrestling movies, it could be any of those things. Feel free to make your suggestions in the comments section below, and you never know when yours might be the winner winner lucky chicken dinner. Anyways, let's get on to the subject at hand, which is In Your House, Bad Blood, 1997. And when it comes to 1997 in WWF history, I always love going back to this year. No, certainly from a business standpoint, no, from a product standpoint, it was not the best year in the company's history and wasn't even the best year in that era of time for the WWF. But to me, it's probably my favorite all around overall year in the company's history. Because if nothing else, 1997 is where you can see the most evolution and change in a wrestling company over the span of one year uh, comparable to maybe 1996 WCW that we've ever seen. And when you start off with 1997 and the Royal Rumble at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio and you see by the time you get to this point, Bad Blood and then a little bit later Survivor Series 1997, to see that change and evolution in the presentation of the WWF and so many things that they did it's always fun to go back and see what was really the foundation for what would become the Attitude Era. And it wasn't perfect. And, you know, even during the Attitude Era, it wasn't perfect. And they hadn't figured it out all the way yet. But I really, again, love going back and watching 1997 WWF as it plays out throughout the course of the year. Because you can see what's coming, especially through the scope of history. You can go back and look and have a greater appreciation for this is when they started to figure this out. This is when they started to figure that out. This is when this and that started to come together. And I will say in general, when I look back through the scope of history at professional wrestling, arguably my favorite year period might very well be 1997. You had NWO and all the things they were doing. Um, at WCW, you had Sting coming after Hogan for basically an entire year. You had that short title reign of Luger. That was awesome. The beginnings of Goldberg and his streak. Uh, ECW had their first ever pay-per-view in April of 97 with Barely Legal. And they were kind of on the ground running for what they were. And then the WWF was starting to become hip again. Starting. They were starting to connect. They were starting to find their way in this new era. And I love going back and looking at the entirety of 1997. I love coming back to a show like In Your House Bad Blood 97. One of the best show by any means. But I look at it <clears throat> and I see everybody on this show has some type of shtick, gimmick, character. They have something. Something that could potentially make them unique. Something that could potentially help them stand out. All the way from the lowest guy in the totem pole to the highest guy, the WWF champion. Everybody's got some type of shtick, some type of character, some type of gimmick. And by now, at this point in time in 1997, in that one year period of time, you could really see that change in evolution in these characters going away from really hokey and kid-based kind of crappy characters that were out of touch with the mainstream to these relevant characters you know these edgy cutting edge type of characters that were changing the mold and shaking things up especially with known commodities like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels and Taker those guys were evolving they were changing you had new faces on the scene such as Austin and The Rock who were slowly but surely just starting to figure it out and the WWF was just slowly starting to figure out what they had in those guys. And this is, when you go back and look through the scope of history, this is an incredibly exciting time in this company's history. 
by the time you got to the end of 1997, you've got Vince McMahon announcing the Attitude Era, and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, when you look at this show, it's at the Keel Center, St. Louis, Missouri. They draw over 20,000 people. Just going back and looking at that sold-out Keel Center and looking at the fans and looking how much the fans were into it and the reactions that they had throughout the course of the night, this feels like what wrestling should be. And even though 1997 WWF wasn't the best WWF we've ever seen, I would put it up, especially at this point in time in 1997, against any current product we have of any company, and I would take it all day long. I'm sorry, if you think the current WWE product, Impact Wrestling, ROH, New Japan, or any Indie Cuck Fuck Federation is better than 1997 WWF, then we have major significant issues and a disconnect here between what wrestling is and what wrestling should be. Now, in terms of the show itself, you kick off with the tag match, Nation of Domination, uh, taking on and defeating the Legion of Doom. It's a three-on-two handicap match. The Rock had just recently uh, joined the Nation. Now he's heel. And to hear the crowd, man, to know what's become of The Rock and who he ended up being and the megastar that he became both in the wrestling world and ultimately in the movie world, to go back to 1997 here, and people are flipping him the bird. There's still some die, Rocky, die chance. There's Rocky sucks everywhere. And to go back and see that The Rock owned it and embraced it, and he took it, and he started to become, slowly but surely, who he was going to become, you could see at this point in time when you go back and look, you could see the promise of the potential of this five-star talent, this third-generation cat, and you're saying, this dude could be money. This dude could be a monster. He wasn't yet, but he was starting to figure it out. And the WWF at this time was starting to figure it out. Like you look back at the 90s when off the heels of the Million Man March and the things that Minister Louis Farrakhan was saying, it made sense to have a group like the Nation of Domination put this group together and man the heat that they could generate depending on the city they were in like if you see the crowd when the nation's music hits and the nation walks out I mean you got a lot of these white fans in St. Louis are standing up and flipping them off and giving them the bird and we know why that may be but ultimately we would kill for that type of legit heat in professional wrestling today as far as this match it was what this match was and this is a perfect embodiment of how booking should be versus what it is today in today's WWE, you would have this three-on-two handicap match where the faces would dominate the majority of the match and the faces would ultimately go over, or you would have to have all types of interference in order for the heels to win. So basically what would happen is both teams are worse off for it and nobody gets a real benefit from going over. Whereas in this particular case, you book the match in a way where it is competitive, but you give those moments for both the nation and LOD to shine. You build in moments where you try to get some heat to get to the hot tag. You have well-placed interference, but only one real thing of interference with Farouk coming down the ramp. And you ultimately get to the finish and Hawk gets pinned by the rock after the rock bottom. Now what you've done, you've made LOD look strong, look good, and the nation ultimately goes over and you get more heat on them, you get more attention on the rock. This is how it should be. And it was a really, really good opener for what it was. And, and, and thinking about it, it had to be kind of a tough environment for these guys to work in with the news earlier in that day, 20 years ago, that Brian Pillman had passed away in a hotel room at the age of 35. And you could see at the very beginning, they had announced it before the show on the free-for-all. Then they addressed the commentators. It was Vince, it was JR, it was Lawler. Notable in the fact that this was the last WWF pay-per-view that Vince worked in that lead commentary position. Like I said, they were starting to figure it out. Hadn't gotten all the way there yet, but by the time we got to the next pay-per-view and going forward, they really were starting to piece it together. But with Brian Pillman's death, you could tell that it kind of threw things off. He was originally scheduled to wrestle Dude Love. Ultimately, you didn't get that match. 
You got the midget match with a uh, midget tag match with Max Mini and Nova taking on Mosaic and Tarantula. And, I, you know, it's one of these things I even forget about the fact that the WWF at that time had that working relationship with AAA until I go back and watch some of these shows of 1997. And it's, it's just funny that they sat there and said, <laughs> we got to try and go on and do on the do with the show since Pillman's not going to be here, obviously, because he's dead. <laughs> so we think you'll enjoy this. And out comes the midgets. And the whole thing about it, while this match was weird and seemed odd from a WWE standpoint, when Max Mini... <laughs> gets thrown on the table and Jerry the King Lawler points at him and starts laughing going ha 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 it just made the entire match for me and it speaks to the heel commentator genius of Jerry the King Lawler at that time he was great he was magnificent he was using that line about they look bigger on the Lucky Charms box he was money and that little thing right there sometimes it doesn't take much for something to work and for me watching this match, just to get through the whole match, for him to sit there and point at Max Mini and mock him and laugh him for getting thrown on the table. And then the King's headset gets knocked off of him and he, they can't hear him. Vincent JR can't hear him for a minute. That was funny shit. And then you had DOA and Los Bariquas coming in, just kind of filling some time. But thinking about Brian Pillman, I know a lot of people look back very fondly on Brian Pillman and he's been gone now it's hard to believe 20 years and there's no question Brian Pillman did do some good things in professional wrestling I always felt like he was one of those guys that really got it in terms of where the business was but more importantly where the business was gonna go and he started to realize how the dirt sheets and in particular the internet was going to start changing professional wrestling he was really one of the first guys that was kind of on the cutting edge of that so a lot of people We'll go back and look at Brian Pillman's career fondly and talk about how great he was and everything else. I always felt like, personally, my opinion, feel free to flaming keyboard finger or fire me in the comments section. I always felt like, while he did some good things, the angle with Austin was cutting edge shit, maybe going too far stuff. And he did other things like the epic promo in ECW. He had moments and he had flashes. But when you look back at the entirety of his career, even the tag team run with WCW with him and Steve as the Hollywood Blondes, there were bits and moments, but people treat him like a legend, and to me, I'm sorry, he wasn't. He did some innovative stuff. Like I said, I think if he would have been able to stick around for the Attitude Era, he would have been an important player. But sometimes we put him up on this pedestal like he was this great legend, and the simple fact is that he was a guy and he was a good talent, and he was a good personality, a good character, but he was never gonna be a guy that you built a company around. He was never really truly gonna be a top guy. He was best off as a role player. And I know now a lot of you are gonna hate me, but the fact is a lot of the people that will comment on Brian Pillman and talk about how great he was, will ultimately do that having not been old enough to really actually have ever watched him. I was. I pretty much was old enough to watch most of his wrestling career. I mean, because he died at 35, 20 damn years ago. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to control his own demons. He wasn't able to kick his pill habit, and it ended up costing him his life. And I always look at Brian Pillman with a bit of frustration, because I know his best days in the business were ahead of him. I know his best work was ahead of him. And I know he could have been a tremendous asset to the WWF during the Monday Night Wars, during the Attitude Era. And just when you were getting to that point that he really could have been, he basically snuffed out his own life for all intents and purposes. And it sucks. It's unrealized potential. And what could have been and what should have been, and those are fair discussions to have. But I always thought that <clears throat> He got a lot more credit for being greater than he really was, if I'm being honest. Now, with that said, I have to applaud the guys again working this show because they worked this show, literally having found out the news earlier in the day that he had passed away. Could it be fun for the Hart family, you know, knowing that Pillman came up through the dungeon and so on and so forth, and other guys within the locker room? Couldn't have been easy for Steve. Couldn't have been easy for a lot of those guys. But ultimately, they went out there 
and they put their best foot forward. And you could even hear a couple of times Vince trying to set it up on commentary, being like, eh, we're doing the best we can considering the circumstance. And while that's kind of trying to set the bar low in terms of expectations, you know what? In this particular case, I get it. I understand it. It was not an ideal situation. It just wasn't. I'm moving on. Uh, your tag team championship match it was the Godwins defeating the Headbangers to become the new tag team champs. Now, I always thought the Godwins were stupid. And frankly, I always thought the Headbangers were stupid. That said, though, at least the Godwins were characters. And the Headbangers were characters. And in particular with the Headbangers, they fit the culture of the time. They fit what was going on in this country. There were a lot of kids dressing like them, looking like them, acting like them. So they worked. They got over. I look at both of those teams now 20 years later, and I'm like, you wouldn't have those teams work in today's WWE. That's for damn sure. And I don't know if they would really work much of anywhere. And frankly, they were kind of stupid. But back then, it was okay. And even this tag match, a little, a little rough at times, but... Still felt like there were elements of trying to actually piece together a tag match, you know, again, incorporating, trying to build some heat, working in hot tags and so forth. It wasn't that bad. And, and that's the thing about 97 WWF. You would have a lot of mediocre to just not bad, and you would have a couple of real highlights. Um, Owen Hart defeats Farouk to get back the Intercontinental Championship. And of course, this came about, it was an IC title tournament that was announced after SummerSlam when Owen Hart uh, dropped Austin on his head and Austin broke his neck. Even though Austin had won the IC title, he was hurt. He was going to be out of action. So as a result, <laughs> they had to vacate the belt and have this tournament. And my God, going back and watching Owen Hart is always a treat. He was, he was tremendous. Owen 316 says, I just broke your neck. This certainly put it over me. And for Farouk, you know, it's always a shame to me that WCW made Ron Simmons their first black world heavyweight champion, and he was a babyface when he did it, and it was understandable, it was perfectly fine. But the WWF, in order to give Farouk any type of real push, had to make him a militant black man, the leader of basically a quasi-nation of Islam back, Black Panther faction. But Farouk was talented enough to make it believable, to make it work. And the whole thing here worked and then you have the dynamic of Austin coming out and Austin sitting there taking Vince's headset it's like knowing especially what went on in the in the scope of history you look at it and you say man there's something there there's a chemistry there they hadn't figured it out yet they didn't know that that's where they were going but it's interesting when you see those early glimpses of the interactions between Austin and Vince and you know what ended up coming down the pike you're like this was the foundation this is where this type of stuff really started on screen. And then having Austin interfere and hit Farouk with the belt to help Owen Hart win made sense because ultimately Owen Hart's the one that dropped Austin on his neck, not Farouk. So if Austin wants to get back his IC title, who's he going to want revenge on? Not Farouk. He's going to want it on Owen Hart. It works. Then you had the flag match with Team Canada and Team America, as I would call them, Brett and the Bulldog taking on Vader and Patriot. And oh my God, this match was incredibly long. It was really weird. It was a f flag match, but then we changed it to pinfalls and submissions um, <laughs> because most of the guys in this match had some type of injury or another. And as a result, we didn't know what we were going to do there. I don't know what the fuck happened. But you knew you were in for something freaking awesome. When the pre-match promo on live TV, <laughs> Vader drops a bullshit. <laughs> and you can hear Vince and them, they're like, ooh. <laughs> Michael PSAs and his Doc Hendrick shit goes, ooh. <laughs> the one thing I miss about Vader this time, as badly as the company misused him, and as much as they screwed up with him, was that Vader brought a certain element of spontaneity that was sorely needed in the product because you literally never knew what he was going to do and you never knew what he was going to say. And when he would drop a bullshit, man, it was freaking awesome. And you've got fans trying to get into the ring in this match. It was all types of crap. But ultimately, Team Canada prevails. And when I look back at 1997, 
And I'm like, you know, this was the best of the Hitman. This Team Canada run was incredible stuff. I was never a fan of really of Brett before, not much of one after, but 1997, that Team Canada run, oh, phenomenal stuff where you go into Canada, they're the biggest faces in, in the arena. When they go anywhere else, they're the biggest heels anywhere. And it was interesting that at a pay-per-view like this, you had your WWF world champion in a flag match, Canada versus USA. And you know what, it worked. But ultimately, this show is remembered for one match, as it should be. It is remembered for the main event, Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker in the first ever Hell in a Cell match. 20 years ago, the first ever Hell in a Cell match on WWE pay-per-view was Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker. And it seems kind of fitting. Two of the lions, really, of that company during that time frame, who would later on be lions of that company years later, I look back at this match, and to me, for my money, I think it's one of the 10 greatest matches in WWF history. I really, truly do. You're going to be hard-pressed to convince me of 10 matches in the company's history that were better. You might be very hard-pressed to tell me five matches that were better. I could maybe make an argument that this might be the best match in the history of the WWF. And I mean that. I really, really do, because so many things about this worked. So many things about it were perfect. Sometimes we think back fondly on the first, and we think the first was the best, but in actuality, we were fumble-fucking around, and we didn't know what the hell we were doing, and we were just happy to get a nut. Um, it's not always the best. We try to remember it as being better than it actually was. But every time I go back and watch this bad blood match between Sean and Taker, it always lives up to the expectations. I always find something to appreciate about it. You know, them climbing up the cell, but not sitting there and doing a ridiculous spot. Just Sean doing something simple, falling off the hell in a cell, onto the announce table, not saying that's a minimal bump, but <clears throat> knowing where Taker would go with other people like Mankind and such in hell in a cell. This, this is the foundation, and again, this is where it started. And I look back at this match, and to me, it was this type of stuff that the WWE was starting to do that was kind of shaking them to the core and fundamentally changing the way they presented their product that eventually you got to a point where they had the best characters, where they had the best presentation, and they had as much extreme shit as anybody else as they could have on a national television program. They had the flexibility to go TVMA where WCW did not. And ultimately, I don't care what anybody says, as great as ECW was in its time for what it was, it was what it was. And when you got to the point where WWF was starting to do these things with the superior production values and the superior talent, you got to a point of where, why would you bother watching ECW as much? Because the WWF was giving you this type of stuff. It was the first ever Hell in a Cell match, five star. If you want to talk about five star shit, this is five star stuff. These guys told a hell of a story. And then to top it all off, the first ever Hell in a Cell match on pay-per-view for the WWE happened to be the debut of Kane. And you had been building this up and teasing it for a while. And just when you think Taker is going to find a way to win this match against Shawn Michaels, after they've gone out of the cage, they've gone on top of the cell, they've done all this other crap, here comes Kane ripping the door off. And, and you think now about Glenn Jacobs and Kane, and you think about how bad the character got, how much they overutilized him, how he wasn't a big attraction or big deal anymore, and you wanted him to go away 20 years ago when he's sitting there ripping the cage door off, when he's walking in and he's sitting there and putting his hands up like this and the fire shoots and the lights come on and he's Tombstone and Taker and looking like a legit badass. I mean, this was a big freaking deal. And this is one of these things that the WWE used to do so well. You would have stories within stories within stories. You had the story between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. You had the story between The Undertaker and Paul Bearer. And then you bring in a new story, the story between The Undertaker and Kane. And now you're setting off, and this is your launching point for Shawn Michaels to go off and do other stuff. Uh, most notably Survivor Series, we know what happened there. And this is also your launching point for Undertaker and Kane and ultimately getting to their match at WrestleMania 14. This is an iconic match, a historic match, a legendary match, 
in the scope of WWE history. And for the, the WWF, in that type of circumstance, the same day that they found out about the death of Brian Pillman and having to sit there and adjust some things on the fly, clearly not being in their best state of mind, I thought this company did a great job of putting on the best show they probably were capable of at this point in time in their company's history in late 1997. It wasn't perfect. There weren't a lot of great matches. But when you go back and you look at the talent that was there, you look at the fact that you had characters, you had gimmicks, you had shticks, you had stories, you had these known commodities, these established top guys like Brett and Sean and Taker, the new faces coming down the pike like Austin and Rock. Man, it's a lot of fun to go back and watch a show like this. And frankly, if nothing else, if you don't care about any of that other stuff, if you ever want to figure out why people are wrestling fans, and stay wrestling fans, even when the product's not as good, even when it's not as entertaining, even when we find more reasons to complain about it than enjoy it. It's matches like Bad Blood 1997, Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell with the debut of Kane. That's the type of stuff that made us wrestling fans, that kept us wrestling fans and keeps us wrestling fans to this day. Those are the moments we live for. Man, I love going back and watching some of these old shows to be able to look back through the scope of history and seeing how everything played out and the fact that this was the launching point for a 20 plus year character in Kane, the fact that Undertaker was still around 20 years later, Shawn Michaels, you know, even with his time off after WrestleMania 14, three and a half years, he still had several more years after that. And looking at what happened and everything else, to me, one of the greatest matches in WWF slash WWE history, and you'd be damned to tell me otherwise. Is this a show I recommend? Yes. Because I think it's important when we go about praising this company for the Attitude Era and pumping up the Monday Night Wars and pumping up this company and their ultimate victory during this time frame, I think it's really important to get some context of how far they had gotten from the beginning of 1997 to here and within another year how much more they had evolved and changed and improved in so many capacities as a company. This is a fun moment in time in WWF history because you could see what's coming around the bend. And with matches like Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell, it was clear to me even back then that while they weren't the top dogs at that time, they were going to take their rightful place on top of the wrestling mountain again pretty damn soon. <laughs>